the Catholic politician's position and the church's position should be, look, I believe many things as a Catholic. And when I think things I believe as a Catholic would be good for you as an atheist or a Jew or a Sikh or a Confucian or a Buddhist or an agnostic or whatever you are, if I think it's good for all of you as a governor, I'm going to try to convince you with two things, my own good example and love. That's how I'll convince you. And I'll tell you that I have lived up to this and it's been good for me and good for my family in this way or that way and I want to share it with you because I love you. Not because I think you're a sinner or because you're wrong. And I give you the benefit of my own experience with this truth and I wish to share it with you. And then maybe hope for a consensus. That's the way it ought to happen. It does not happen by you case. It does not happen by fiat, especially if that can be called hypocrisy. The bishops wrote letters on the economy, letters on poverty. They've taken positions for years about the dangerous fragmentation in this country between uh, people who make massive amounts of money and people, 35 million of them today who are poor, 11 million children living at serious risk. Uh, the, the Catholic Church regards that as immoral for the wealthiest, most powerful nation in world history to tolerate a situation where there are so many poor. And that's lost on our population. That's called mushy-headed liberalism. That's Catholicism at its very best. If you study the life of Jesus for three years, he spent very little time in prohibitions and prescriptions. He did uh, say, damn be he who calls his brother Raka, you know, so don't curse anybody. And he did throw the money lender down the steps of the temple because it was a desecration. But most of his time was spent with, you know, people who were sinners, people who were ill, trying to, the Sermon on the Mount is the best illustration of Christianity at the core. It's not, not for me to, to challenge my church. I'm, uh, I, I, I want the church to take care of me as a, as a very, very vulnerable sinner. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose my uh, right to their solicitous attitude. <laughs> so you should think of the church as human beings. We are the church, all the Catholics, the lay people are part of the church. The priests are part of the church and they are like us sinners. And so when you catch a rabbi, if you're Jewish, committing a bad sin, or a priest or a minister committing a bad sin, that doesn't have anything to do with the religion. The religion doesn't assume that everybody who strives to make themselves better by believing in some set of spiritual tenets is going to be a saint. That's an absurdity. So there's a difference between the church human and the religion it seeks to promote. There's a difference between democracy and the president who is seeking to promote democracy. And if the president fails however he or she fails, that doesn't mean democracy fails. So if you see it that way, we shouldn't despair about our religion. We should, however, be unhappy with our church, which we are, our church of humans. And, and to some extent, the human thing is to say, well, gee Willick, is now when my kids listen to a priest, they're going to wonder whether the priest is good or bad. But they should always have wondered about that. That should have nothing to do with the message that gets. Elma Gantry, you know, is a good example. It, it's not the soul of the person who's delivering the statement. It is the truth of the statement that's being delivered that makes it important. Now, remember, the word is faith. It's not knowledge. The word is faith, and the reason you use faith is you can't use knowledge. It's not that you know all these things to be true that are part of your religion when you're talking about faith. It's that you choose to believe them. You choose to suspend the need for intellectuality because intellectually you can't deal with it, and so you choose to believe it. You couldn't possibly intellectualize that there's a heaven. Uh, you choose to believe it. You, you can't prove intellectually that Christ rolled back the stone. You choose to believe it. That's called faith. It doesn't collide with your intellect, but it's not proven by your intellect. So, so nothing I did uh, collided with my faith. It didn't. 
uh, it collided with what the pope, well not the pope, but the bishops thought should be done politically. So, so our difference was basically political. When the church teaches that you ought to love one another and try to help one another, and you ought to avoid killing one another, unless it's absolutely essential, and so they declare that some wars are just occasions for you to kill other people, and some are not. That is obviously a truth that has significance only if you try to sell it to the population. And so that is a truth which, implicit in that truth, is the importance of its being accepted by the whole population. And so, but there, the Catholic Church seems to be saying very little at the moment. Now they did, the bishops did declare the war unjust. And so you, you would have to ask yourself then, well, there's a truth that really does have relevance to the whole population, whatever their religion. And that's one we should be banging away at, but apparently the, church, the, the bishops feel differently. Right after Notre Dame, I wrote a piece that's an op-ed piece in the, in the Times, I wish I had it to give to you, New York Times. I said, look, I've made myself clear on the abortion issue, I think, clearer than anybody ever did, because nobody wrote that much and shared it with the world the way I did. I said, but l let's, let's get something else clear. Whatever religion you're in, I think most human beings would agree we have more abortions than we're comfortable with, a million and a half a year or whatever it is, and that the, the terrible choice that a woman has to make, whether to have an abortion or not, happens too frequently especially in the case of unwanted pregnancies, undesired pregnancies. And so, without offending anybody's religion, we should work very hard to limit the number of unwanted pregnancies. How do you do that? Well, first we should start with the young people, and we should, we should argue strenuously abstention. And I don't believe and all this talk about, nah, what's the point? They're going to do it anyway. Yeah, I know they're going to. Nobody knows better than I. I've got 11 granddaughters. I've, you know, I've five kids, and I was young once. So I know that people are going to get involved anyway. But when you avoid teaching abstention, it's the same as promoting the other thing. So just to cover that base, teach abstention. The best thing for you to do is wait until you get lucky and find somebody you really love, and then use this ultimate gift that God has given you. Because if you use it up before then, you know, it won't mean as much to you. Okay, that's right. Now they're not going to listen to you. So give them education as to birth control. Now, for only for those people whose religion allows them to use contraceptives. Make the contraceptives available. Give them education, whether they're religious or not. Do it in the public schools. Teach them about this. Now, if despite all of that and the availability of contraceptives, you have a young person or an older person who has a pregnancy she does not want. Now the temptation is for abortion. Make sure you give that woman the same right and the same help in bringing the baby to term that you would in giving her the right to, for an abortion. <coughs> I'm sorry. So allow her to bring the baby to term and then help her with an adoption. Try to convince her, look, you don't need an abortion here. If you think you're not ready for this child, if you think that you, you're not in a position to do the child justice. Let's work toward an, abortion, uh, an adoption. Let's make it easier to have an adoption. And we'll pay for your going to term. We'll give you a good doctor. We'll deliver the child and we will arrange the, the uh, adoption. I think if we worked aggressively at all those things, we could reduce significantly the number of abortions without ever offending anybody, without ever denying a woman choice, and without ever breaking any religious rules. Except, now, I was careful about contraceptives. Only those people who were, obviously, you're not going to push, uh, some, force somebody to use contraceptives who doesn't want to. But for those people who are free to use them, you should make them available. I think this country desperately needs religion. I think all countries do. Religion in the sense of a belief in something larger than yourself much larger than yourself, that rationalizes your own existence. And I think the idea that people may still be killing one another over religious confusion, as they always have, is truly tragic. Because all the religions I'm aware of, 
starting with monotheism, forget paganism, starting with monotheism, starting with the Hebrews. All the religions I can name, whether they have a God or not in them, have two principles. For the Jews, tzedakah and tikkun olam. For the Christians, love one another as you love yourself for the love of me. For I am truth. And the truth is God made the world but didn't complete it, and you want to be collaborators in creation. So two truths. You should love one another as human beings, and you should lock arms and make this place better to live in. The only truth you're absolutely certain of, that you don't need faith for, is the value of the next breath you're going to draw, the value of your life. And the two religious truths that are common to everything and should be common to our politics and the way we conduct our affairs here in Iraq and everywhere else is we're supposed to love one another and we're supposed to work together to make the place better. That's the purest religion. That would be the best politics.